So, Pastor Gibson, welcome again. Welcome to our guests, uh, and we look forward to having you with us many, many more times. Thank you for being with us on this special Shabbat at the beginning of our Martin Luther King Day weekend. And on a special Shabbat wherein we also start the reading of a new book of our Pentateuch, of the second book of the five books of Moses. The book that we know in English to be called the book of Exodus because it speaks about the Exodus. Uh, but a book that in Hebrew is not called Exodus, in Hebrew it's called Shmot. And Shmot it's called because of a word that appears in the first verse of that book. Ve'ele Shmot b'nei Yisrael hayordim mitzrayim. These are the names of the children of Israel, the children of Jacob, who went down to Egypt. And then it goes on to list their names. Reuben, Uven, Shimon, Levi, Reuben, Simon, and Levi, and so on and so forth, the 12 names. And it says that there were 70 people who were descendants of Jacob, descendants of Israel, who moved to Egypt. So the book of Exodus that we know as the book of Exodus is in Hebrew known as the book of Shemot, which means the book of names. And names are important. I think we would agree that names are important. Uh, and one name is especially important in the context of the beginning of that chapter, and that is the name of Joseph. It says there in that first chapter, in verse 6 of the chapter, that Joseph died, Vayamot Yosef ve'echav v'chol hadorahu, the Joseph died and his brothers died and all that generation died out. And the children of Israel grew in numbers in Egypt. They were no longer just 70. They grew in numbers in Egypt. And then in verse 8 we read, Vayakom melech hadash. Al Mitzrayim, Asher lo yada et Yosef. And a new king arose upon Egypt who did not know Joseph. And we ask ourselves the question well, what does this mean? Did he not know Joseph's name? Maybe he forgot the name. What, what does it mean that he didn't know Joseph personally? Maybe he had heard of Joseph. Maybe he knew Joseph's name. But maybe he didn't know Joseph personally. And the rabbis then asked the question, well, why do we need to know this? What's the significance of this? Who cares if he knew Joseph if he didn't know Joseph? Unless we know Joseph... And if we know Joseph, then perhaps it makes a little bit of sense. Because Joseph was the young man who had been torn away from his homeland and brought over to a foreign country. Because Joseph was a person who arrived in this new country with absolutely nothing and in servitude as a slave, and who ended up being a slave in Egypt before Joseph gained his freedom, Joseph was always regarded as an immigrant, as different, as not of the country. It didn't matter how long he had lived there. He'd already become Egyptian. He was a high official he was always different. Something else about Joseph. And the descendants of Joseph had lived hundreds of years in Egypt. And Egypt, believe me, I hope you'll believe me, was a land of immigrants. 
Egypt was cosmopolitan. There were Nubians, Ethiopians in Egypt. There were Sudanese in Egypt. There were Israelites in Egypt. There were Libyans in Egypt. We know from Egyptian culture, Egypt was one of the centers of the world. It was a place that attracted people. It was an immigrant country. Oh, but Joseph, the descendants of Jacob, they they were immigrants. They were different. There's something about them that was different. But there's more about Joseph. As a young man, Joseph was incarcerated. Joseph was imprisoned. And the criminal justice system didn't particularly listen to Joseph. He didn't have much of a voice. He didn't have much of a backing. He had to go through prison. And Joseph was the kind of person who had to be better than anyone else, who had to prove himself beyond all the sorcerers, all the magicians, all the counselors of Pharaoh in order to be recognized, in order to be released from prison, in order to get somewhere in his life. So the rabbis write about this. What does it mean that the new king rose upon Egypt and didn't know Joseph? The meaning is probably a new king arose upon Egypt and didn't understand the story of Joseph, didn't understand the story of that part of humanity. Perhaps a new king arose on Egypt who didn't understand and was particularly open to immigrants, to people who were seen to be different, though they had lived there for hundreds of years. To people who had experienced servitude, who had gone through the criminal justice system. To people who were seen to be different. In other words, A new king arose upon Egypt, and the rabbis write this, who could not recognize humanity. So we are here at the beginning of our reading of the book of names, the book of Exodus, thinking about the story of Joseph, and especially honored and privileged to have you with us, Pastor Gibson, and to be celebrating this Shabbat with your congregation, and thinking and remembering that we are descendants of Joseph and the children of Israel, all of us, and thinking and remembering that we have been redeemed from Egypt but that something of Egypt has remained within us. That Egypt is not in Egypt. Egypt is in our cities, in our communities, in our prisons, in our institutions, and even perhaps in our churches, or in our temples, or in other places, or in the families that we belong to, and that today, at the beginning of the Martin Luther King Day weekend, we must stand for humanity. We must stand for Joseph. Pastor Gibson, thank you for being with us. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for allowing me to be here. Uh, Rabbi Cohen, you can come and preach that one <laughs> on Sunday. And, and that, was, that was so good. It, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, honestly, that was uh, incredible. It was incredible. And so I feel welcomed here, uh, grateful to be here. Thank you for coming out in. in um, really braving the elements today and, and so grateful for your presence. I'm thankful for the invitation, thankful for the collaboration, 
thrilled that we got a chance to do Juneteenth in 2022, as well as the time in Riddle Hall, and um, just so grateful for the time to be here. So we have so much in common. We have so much in common. We share a common faith. We share a common heritage. We share a common history of surviving and sustaining through consistent oppression. We also share a desire for freedom and also share a desire for a bright future. And so I'm grateful for those things that bring us together. And so as we come here today, I'm also reminded of another thing that we share together. And, and, and Cantor, thank you for thank you for the music. It was incredible. There were many devotional moments there about peace. And one of the things we share in common is a desire for peace. Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. And so shalom is important to all of us. So in our culture, in our culture, some of the, the most hit people in our culture, when, when we have a greeting, the greeting at the end, somebody will say, they don't just want to say bye or see you later, they'll say peace. Some of the most hit people that you see will say peace. And so I want us to think about that commonality for us today. Because the term shalom has great value. And so for us, for us, and when we look in the Bible, the term love has many different meanings. And it's really been, it's really been kind of watered down into one word in our language. Similarly with shalom, shalom actually has many different meanings. And I'm, I'm you know, and I should just really kind of pass the mic to, because Rabbi would do this much better than I, than I would. But shalom, we think about shalom as peace. And yes, it is peace. But shalom also, as we look at the definition of shalom, it's also not just peace, but it's also peace with God. And in our tradition, that is really, really important. Like we emphasize a lot the importance of having peace with God. And we, we talk about it in lots of different ways. We talk about it as in righteousness and having peace with God. And so that's a way of thinking about shalom. So shalom is a greeting. It is a greeting we often greet each other. But it also to us, and I believe, and, and Rabbi will correct me afterwards and, 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 and make sure I get it right, but it is also... It is also peace with God. Another way to look at our definition of shalom is the absence of war or discord or tension. And that's the way we often think about peace, and we want that shalom. We want the absence of war, discord, or tension. But sometimes the peace is actually during the war. It's during the tension. And it's during the discord that we have a level of peace, even though a lot is going on around us. And that's also a shalom. But then there's another definition of shalom. And this is the last one I'll give because I'm, I'm out of my depth, um, Rabbi. But the term shalom also means wholeness. And it means a respect for humanity. That when I see you, when I see you, if I give you a greeting of shalom, I am acknowledging that you are a holy human. And if you are not there, it is my desire that you get there. And so shalom is also, it is also a recognition of wholeness. That you are indeed a whole human. And so as we think about that today, I would have us to go beyond the greeting the greeting is important, the greeting is important, but we have to go beyond the greeting. Mazel, mazel tov to the Greenberg family today. Mazel tov to the Greenberg family um, and, and Gideon on, on the great accomplishment. And so I wanna spend a moment 
And Judges, and for us, Judges, the sixth chapter, you can look in, you know, ABC, you can look in your spare time. There is this story about Gideon. Really, I'm not, if you look at my notes, in my notes, it actually has Gideon there. So it really does. And so I'm not just doing this. I know they're used to me doing stuff on the fly. But um, in, in Judges, the sixth chapter, so in the book of Judges, um, for us, it describes um, 12 kind of leaders, 12 leaders, and the fifth of the 12 leaders, his name was Gideon. His name was Gideon. Uh, the, the leader who preceded him was Deborah. And I think the last one of the 12 is probably Samson. And so I want to talk about Gideon today. I really, I really do. I really do. And so thank you for the occasion, Gideon. Thank you. Thank you. You, you know, just, just right on time. There are no coincidences in my life. And so, so Gideon, in the, in, the, in the sixth chapter of Judges, here's how it, here's how it goes. And so it says that... Um, God's people, the Israelites, had been disobedient. They had disobeyed God. And because they disobeyed God, God handed them into the, put them um, really in the hands of the Midianites and the Amalekites. So for seven years, for seven years, and it, and it says, it says that they actually had to live in caves. They had to live in caves because what the Amalekites and what the um, Midianites would do is when um, they had crops, they would actually destroy the crops. And so the Midianites were always really, they were really kind of the bullies. They were the bullies, and they would try to destroy everything, everything that God's people had done. And so there was no shalom. There was no shalom. And so in order to get to Shalom, Gideon has this unique relationship with Adonai to get them to Shalom, to get them to Shalom. And so I want to I highlight a couple of things, but to get to Shalom, the first thing that had to happen is they had to acknowledge, they had to acknowledge that they had actually done some things that were not right and pleasing. And so to get to Shalom, it requires responsibility and collaboration. So the pathway, the pathway to shalom requires responsibility and collaboration. Now, I want to put that in context because very often we were talking about the problems of our day, and I want to get into the deep right now. There is a narrative that African Americans or black people don't take responsibility for what's going on in our community. I just want to speak plainly. Because very often, it's like, okay, well, you aren't taking care of your own stuff. And because you aren't taking care of your own stuff, why should we even care? And so one of the, the first thing that Gideon does is Gideon, Gideon acknowledges that um, that the, the people of God had, had been disobedient. And so let me look at some areas, let me look at some areas, and let me talk about responsibility. Let me talk about responsibility. So one area, one area is family. If you're looking at, and so, and, and I, I give this to you because, so I, I walk, I, as a pastor, I walk in the path of Martin Luther King. He blazed the trail, and all of us are on that path. And so we have to look at not so much the history, but we have to look at how we apply it today. And so if we're, if we're talking about being responsible today, one of the places we have to start is family. And so for the African-American community, depending upon where you look at it, which statistics you look at, between 58 and 63% of African-American families have single-parent homes. And so that's not best practices. Right, that's not best practices, and that's not really the way that God designed it. And so for the vast majority, and then if you were to, if you were to look at the other extreme, so for um, the majority of Caucasians in our, in our country, it's about 20%. So if we're looking at that as a pastor, I have to take responsibility, and as a community, we have to take responsibility for the number of single-parent households, and we have to do everything we can to support families, and not to say it's someone else's problem. Now, I want to say that publicly. I want to say that publicly. Just as I also, and this is an aside, this is an aside, and so 
I also want to state publicly that some of the anti-Semitic statements that you heard last year from entertainers and athletes are not representative of our community. They're representative of extreme thoughts, and I'm not even going to mention the names <laughs> because I don't want to highlight it, but just know that those anti-Semitic comments, because they have positions of stature, are not representative in our community. And so coming back, coming back to, you know, so we take responsibility for the fact that there are single parent households and that has to be fixed. Now, it is complicated, it's complicated because part of the reason there are single parent households is because we haven't focused on it, but there are also systemic reasons. Because when we imprison males, if you go to the juvenile detention center today and we're scheduled to go there tomorrow and you see 90% African-American males, part of the responsibility falls within the community, part of it's also systemic. And so that's one of the issues that we look at. Let me look at another issue. And again, there always has to be responsibility that's taken. If we look at literacy, so if we look at literacy rates, and I'm thrilled to see the young people who are here today. And it's so important that you be able to read. If we look at literacy rates, if we look at literacy rates, and so um, to have basic literacy, basic literacy, the country average is about 65%. The country average is about 65%. And basic literacy is to read at an eighth grade level, but we really need to be able to read at the proficient level, which means that you can read things and do well in your job. And so if you look at that, the highest group, the highest group in the United States, and it's about 80%, are Asians. They have the highest literacy level in the country. What group has the lowest literacy level? African Americans. And so we have to take responsibility for that because there's not a shortage of books. There's not a shortage of books. And we also have to make sure, and we are taking responsibility. One of the persons here who is passionate about literacy and runs our after school program and presses it hard. And so we are taking responsibility, but we can't shove that off. We could say, we could say, that the schools have the responsibility to make sure that there's literacy, but actually it begins with the family. The family has to take the responsibility, going back to the first point. So we take responsibility for it, but we also acknowledge that we live in a, we live in a district where most of the schools are failing. So we have to take responsibility as a community so the African American community has to take responsibility, but so does the broader community. Let me go to another area. So we went from family to literacy. Let's talk about the workplace. Let's talk about jobs. And so with jobs, there also has to be responsibility. We're in the process of trying to construct some homes and I was having a conversation with the builder. And I said to the builder, I said, so when we begin constructing these homes, there has to be diversity. There has to be people who live in the city and people who are representative of the city. And he said to me, he said, Pastor, he said, you know, they're just not out there. And, and so I anticipated that because all my life I've been hearing there aren't enough black people out there. There aren't enough people to fill the spots. And so what happens when we accept that narrative, what we do is we kick the can down the road. Because here's what he said to me, he said, listen, we will hold a pizza party and we'll invite lots of people to come. But he said, pastor, we've done that before. He said, we've done that before. And he said, I'm, I'm just telling you that people are gonna come to the pizza party, but we aren't gonna get people to become part of the trades. And so what he was saying to me is he was willing to do a shalom greeting, but he was not willing, he was not willing to take the extra step to see the wholeness of people. And so I was ready, I was prepared that moment, I was prepared for that meeting in the moment, and I said, so listen, I said, you know, we actually, so we control this project, and so who the builder is, you know, we're gonna make that decision. 
And so here's what I need you to commit to. For every three units, for every house that gets constructed, there has to be one person of color who sticks in the trades. And he says, well, how are we going to get that? I, he says, he says that, that's going to be really tough. I said, I appreciate that it may, take, it may take seven who actually get hired, and they may not make it through, but we got to have at least one to stick, and we're going to invest in it. We'll invest money in it, and we will also invest people to support them because if they get leveraged on the work site, and they might not have a dad to speak to who's been through it, then we want to create the shalom because we want to make sure that they're viewed as a whole person. And I need to be able to call you and say, as the owner, they're getting leveraged. So we have this environment. And what he said to me, what he had said to me earlier in the conversation, he said, Pastor, he said, we've hired a lot of people from Ukraine. And so that's good because I suspect that it takes an extra effort if you're integrating somebody from Ukraine, you have to take that extra effort as shalom to view someone as a whole person who doesn't look like you. Getting close. Here's another area that we have to take responsibility for. And it's counter, it's antithetical to shalom. And it's gun violence. It's gun violence. So in our congregation, a 17-year-old, 17, 18-year-old 17 now, who is the senior Garfield Heights, two and a half weeks ago, was shot four times. And so he's in the hospital now. Uh, thankfully, he survived, but he has not regained um, the use of his legs. Just a few days ago at John Adams, there was another shooting, and we have two members of our congregation who are on staff there, many people who live in that neighborhood. And so when we look at this, how are we a nation of shalom? How are we a nation of shalom if we have this gun violence? And so shalom is not just a greeting, but it's really going to depth and viewing people as whole people because if we view, if we view these, these murders and we become comfortable and callous to them, then it's not really shalom. And in our country right now, there is essentially silence about gun violence. There is essentially silence about gun violence. And let me give you, let me give you some thoughts about, let me give you some thoughts about gun violence or, or silence. And these are my notes. And so some of this is, is, is going off my memory. But Leonardo da Vinci um, said that when we are silent, then we empower wicked forces. When we are silent, we, we empower wicked forces. Albert Einstein, Albert Einstein said that silence is complicity. That we were silent, that we're actually complicit. Mahatma Gandhi had similar thoughts, but Martin Luther King, he says when we are silent, it begins to feel like betrayal. When we are silent, it begins to feel like betrayal. It does not feel like shalom. It does not feel like welcoming, but that's what it feels. It feels like betrayal. And so I want to kind of bring this together. And so our goal going forward has to be to create an environment of shalom. We can't just say it. It can't just be a greeting, but we have to view people as whole people. And unless we do it, it won't happen. Here's the history of this country. In 1787, when they were putting together the Constitution, they had this compromise between the northern and southern states. It's known as the Three-Fifths Compromise. And what the Three-Fifths Compromise did is it said that we are going to count the black people who live in the South 
only for purposes, only for purposes of the census and power for the electoral college, but they can't vote, and for taxes so that we can get more tax money. And so from the very beginning of this country, from the very beginning of this country, black people have been viewed as less than, and that's not shalom. Because the very nature of shalom is that I view you as a whole person, I respect you. And so the roots of this country, the roots of this country are not rooted in shalom, but God has given us shalom. And so how do we know that we have shalom? We know it because we received it today in a tremendous way. But we also know that it's in the books that we read. And so I'm, I'm going to butcher this. I'm going to butcher this, Rabbi. So in Genesis, the first chapter, in the 27th verse, it says we were made in Adonai's image, that we are image bearers. And I'm going to butcher this. All right, so there is, there is a... Um, a Hebrew phrase, I believe, and it's, it's Bethlehem Elohim. Bethlehem Elohim. I know, I, like, my, my accent is horrible. My accent is horrible. Bethlehem, they, they don't want to, they want to, they don't want to. Bethlehem, Bethlehem Elohim. Bethlehem Elohim. Bethlehem Elohim. I, I knew I had this part of it. But, but what that means, what that means is we are made in the image of God. And that is part, and, and as I look at it, as I look at those, and so we know that, and, and for us, and part of the, part of the history um, for us, and, 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 and Elder Parker would talk about this, is, is part of our history is, is what's called the Imago Dei. The Imago Dei, which is the very same, it's the very same. Thomas Aquinas came up with this idea that we're made in the image of God. They were made in the image of God. And so in order to move forward, in order to move, move forward, we have to take responsibility, but there also has to be collaboration. We have to put aside our thoughts about family and blaming groups and saying that groups have not taken responsibility for family. We have to work together for literacy. We have to work together for jobs. And we have to work together for gun violence to reduce it because that brings about true, that brings about true shalom. And so our challenge today as we move forward is to go beyond the greeting. Gideon, Gideon at the end, because God allows him to be victorious over the Midianites, he then is able to refer to his God. He's able to refer to his God as Jehovah Shalom or the God of peace. God bless you.